Hello, my name is Sin Bagley, and I am reading The Skylark of Space by E.E. E. Doc Smith in collaboration with Lee Hawkins Garby, and this is Chapter 15, The Escape from Mardanelle. That was a wonderful bluff, Dick, exclaimed the Kofidex in English as soon as Nalboon and his guards had disappeared. That was exactly the tone to take with him, too. You've sure got him guessing. It seemed to get to him all right, but I'm wondering how long it'll hold him. I think we'd better make a dash for the Skylark right now. Before he has time to think it over, don't you? That is undoubtedly the best way, Dunark replied, lapsing in his own tongue. Now, Boone is plainly in awe of you now, but I under if I understand him at all, he is more than determined to seize your vessel, and every Darkham's delay is dangerous. The Earth people quickly secured the few personal belongings they had brought with them, stepping out into the hallway and waving away the guards. Seaton men motioned Dunark to lead the way. The other captives fell in behind as they had done before, and the party walked boldly toward the door of the palace. The guards offered no opposition, but stood at attention and saluted as they passed, and as they approached the entrance, however, Seaton saw the major domo hurrying away and surmised that he was carrying the news to Nalboon. Outside the door, walking directly toward the landing dock, Dunark spoke in a low voice to Seaton without turning. Now Boone knows by this time that we are making our escape, and it will be war to the death from here to the Skylark. I do not think there will be any pursuit from the palace, but he has warned the officers in charge of the dock, and they will try to kill us as soon as we step out of the elevator, perhaps sooner. Now Boone intended to wait, but we have forced his hand, and the dock is undoubtedly swarming with soldiers now. Shoot first and soonest. Shoot first and think afterward. Show no mercy, as you will receive none. Remember that the quality you call mercy does not exist upon all snow. Rounding a great metal statue from 50 feet from the base of the towering dock, they saw that the door leading into one of the elevators was wide open, and that two guards stood just inside it. As they caught sight of the approaching party, the guards raised their rifles, but quick as they were, Seaton was quicker. At the sight of the open door, he made two quick steps and then hurled himself across the intervening 40 feet in a long football plunge. Before the guards could straighten, he crashed into them, his momentum hurling them across the elevator cage and crushing them into unconsciousness against its metal wall. Good work, said Dunark, as he preceded the others into the elevator, and after receiving Satan's permission, distributed the weapons of the two guards among the men of his party. Now we can surprise those upon the roof. That was why you didn't shoot? Yes, I was afraid to risk a shot. It would give the whole thing away, Satan replied, as he threw the unconscious guards onto the grounds and closed the massive door. Aren't you going to kill them, asked Sitar, amazement in every feature and a puzzled expression in her splendid eyes. A murmur arose from the condolians, which was quickly had silenced by the Kofodex. It is dishonorable for a soldier of Earth to kill a helpless prisoner, he said briefly. We cannot understand it, but we must not attempt to sway him in any point of honor. Denark stepped up to the controls, and the elevator shot upward, stopping at a landing several stories below the top of the dock. He took a peculiar device from his belt and fitted it over the muzzle of his strange pistol. We will get out here, he instructed the others, and go up the rest of the way by the little used flight of stairs. We will probably encounter some few guards, but I can dispose of them without raising an alarm. You will all stay behind me, please. Seaton remonstrated, and Nanak went on. No, Seaton, you have done your share, and more. I am upon familiar ground now, and we can do the work alone better than if you were to help me. I will call upon you, however, before we reach the dock. The Kofodix led the way, his pistol resting lightly against his hip, and at the first turn of the corridor they came full upon four guards. The pistol did not move from its place to the side of the leader, but there were four subdued clicks, and the four guards dropped dead with bullets through their brains. Seen that is some silencer, whispered Duchesne. I didn't suppose a silencer could work that fast. They don't use powder, Seaton replied absently, all his faculties directed toward the next corner. The bullets were propelled by an electrical charge. In the same manner, Dunark disposed of several more guards before the last stairway was reached. Seaton, he whispered, 
In English, now is the time we need your rapid pistol work and your high explosive shells. There must be hundreds of soldiers on the other side of that door armed with a machine gun cannon shooting high explosive shells at the rate of a thousand per minute. Our chance is this. Their guns are probably trained upon the elevators and main stairways. Since this passage is unused and none of us would be expected to know of it, most of them don't know of it themselves. It will take them a second or two to bring their guns to bear upon us. We must do all the damage we can, kill them all if possible, in a second or two. If Crane will lend me a pistol, we'll make rush together. I have a better scheme than that, interrupted Shane. Next to you, Seaton, I'm the faster man with a gun here. Also like you, I can use both hands at once. Give me a couple of clips of those special cartridges, and you and I will blow that bunch into the air before they know we're here. It was decided that the two pistol experts should take the lead, closely followed by Crane and Dunark. The weapons were loaded to capacity and put in read readiness for instant use. Let's go bunch, said Seaton. The quicker we start, the quicker we'll get back. Get ready to run out there, all the rest of you, as soon as the battle's over. Ready? On your marks. Get set. Go. He kicked the door open and there was a stuttering crash as the four automatic pistols simultane simultaneously burst into practically continuous flame. A crash obliterated by the overwhelming concussion of sound as the explosive shells swept the entire roof with a rapid opening fan of death, struck their mass and exploded. Well, it was for the little group of wanderers that the two men in the door were past masters in the art of handling their weapons, and well it was that they had it in their tiny pistol bullets the explosive force of hundreds of giant shells. For rank upon rank of soldiery were amassed upon the roof, rapid fire cannon, terrible engines of destruction were pointing toward the elevators and toward the main stairways and approaches, but so rapid and fierce was the attack that even those trained gunners had no time to point their guns. The battle lasted a little more than a second, being over before either Crane or Dunark could fire a shot, and silence again reigned, even while broken and shattered remnants of the guns and fragments of the metal and stone of the dock were still falling to the ground through the fine mist of what had once been men. Assured by a rapid glance that not a single Mardonalian remained upon the dock, Seaton turned back to the others. Make it snappy, Bunch. This is going to be a mighty unhealthy spot for us in a few minutes. Dorothy threw her arms around his neck in relief. With one arm about her, he hastily led the way across the dock toward the skylark, choosing the path with care because of the yawning holes blown into the structure by the terrific force of the explosions. The skylark was still in place, held immovable by the attractor. What a sight she was. Her crystal windows were shattered. Her mighty plates of four-foot Norwegian armor were bent and cracked and twisted. Two of her doors, warped and battered, hung away from their broken hinges. Not a shell had struck her. All this damage had been done by the flying fragments of the guns and of the dock itself, and Satan and Crane, who had developed the new explosive, stood aghast at its awful power. They hastily climbed into the vessel, and Seaton assured himself that the controls were uninjured. I hear battleships, Dunark said. It is it permitted that I operate one of your machine guns? Go as far as you like, responded Seaton, as he placed the woman beneath the copper bar, the safest place in the vessel, and leaped to the instrument board. Before he reached it, and while Duchesne, Crane, and Dunark were hastening to the guns, the whine of giant helicopter screws were painfully heard. A raging, ranging shell from the first warship, sighted a little low, exploded across the side of the dock above him. As he shot the Skylark into the air under five notches of power, a steady stream of the huge bombs poured through the spot where, an instant before, the vessel had been. Crane and Duchesne aimed several shots of the, at the battleships which were approaching from all sides, but the range was so extreme that no damage was done. They heard the continuous chattering of the machine gun operated by the Kofid Dicks, however, and turned toward him. He was shooting, not at the warships, but at the city, rapidly growing smaller beneath them, moving the barrel of his rifle in a tiny spiral, spraying the entire city with death and destruction. As he looked, the first of the shells reached the ground, just as Dunark ceased firing for a lack of ammunition. They saw the palace disappear, as if by magic, being instantly blotted out in a cloud of dust, a cloud of which, with a spiral motion of dizzying, dizzying rapidity, increased in size until it obscured the entire city.
Hmm. Having attained sufficient altitude to be safe from the possible pursuit and out of range of even the heaviest guns, Seaton stopped the vessel and went out into the main compartment to consult with the other members of the group about their next move. It sure does feel good to get a breath of cold, cool air, folks, he said, as he drew with relief a deep breath of air, which at that great elevation was of an icy temperature and very thin. He glanced at the little group of condolences as he spoke, then leaped back to the instrument board with an apology on his lips. They were gasping for breath and shivering with the cold. He switched on the heating coils and dropped the skylight rapidly in a long descent toward the ocean. If that is the temperature you enjoy, I understand at last why you wear clothes to the Kofadix as soon as he could talk. Do not your planes fly up into the regions of low temperature? asked Crane. Only occasionally, and all high-flying vessels are enclosed and heated to our normal temperature. We have heavy wraps, but we dislike to wear them so intensely that we never subject ourselves to any cold. Well, there's no accounting for taste, returned Seaton. But I can't hand your climate a thing. It's hotter even than Washington in August. And that, as the poet feelingly remarked, is going some. But there's no reason for sitting here in the dark, he continued, as he watched it on the powerful daylight as he switched on the powerful daylight lamps which lighted the vessel with the nearest approach to sunlight possible to produce. As soon as the lights were on, Dorothy looked intently at the strange women. Now we can see what color they really are, she explained to her lover in a low voice. Why, they aren't so different from what they were before, except the colors are much softer and more pleasing. They really are beautiful in spite of being green. Don't you think so, Dick? They're a handsome bunch, all right, agreed, and they were. Their skins were a light, soft green, tanned to an olive shade by their many fervent suns. Their teeth were brilliant and shining grass, grass green, their eyes, and their long, dark, thick hair was glossy black. The condolians looked at the earth visitors and at each other, and the women uttered explanations for her. What a frightful light, exclaimed Sitar. Please shut it off. I would rather be in total darkness than look like this. What's the matter, Sitar? asked the puzzled Dorothy as Seaton turned off the lights. You look perfectly stunning in this light. They see th things differently than we do, explained Seaton. Their optic nerves react differently than ours do. Well, we look all right to them, and they look all right to us. In both kinds of light, they look just as different to themselves and our daylight lamps as we do to ourselves in their green light. Is that explanation clear? It's clear enough as far as it goes, but what do they look like to themselves? That's too deep for me. I can't explain it any better than you can. Take the uh, snowman color map, map, for instance. Can you describe it? It's a kind of greenish-orange, but it seems as though it ought not to look like that color either. That's it exactly. From the knowledge you receive from the educator, it should be a brilliant purple. That is due to the difference in the optic nerves, which explains why we see things so differently from the way the Osnomians do. Perhaps I can describe the way they look to each other in our white light. Can you, Sitar? asked Dorothy. One word describes it. Horrible, replied the Condalian princess, and her husband added, Colors are distorted and unrecognizable, just as your colors are to your eyes in our light. Well, now that the color question is answered, let's get going. I pretty nearly asked you the way, Dunark. Forget that I know it as well as you do. The Skylark set off as, at as high an altitude as the Asnamians could stand. As they neared the ocean, several great... Mardanalian battleships, warned of the escape, sought to intercept them, but the Skylark hopped over them easily, out of range of their heaviest guns, and flew onward at such speed that pursuit was not even attempted. The ocean was quickly crossed, and soon the space car came to rest over the great city, and Seton pointed out the palace, which, with its landing duck nearby, was very similar to that of Nalboon, in the capital city of Mardanal. Crane drew Seton to one side. Do you think it's safe to trust these condalians any more than it was the others? How would it be to stay in the lark instead of going into the palace? Yes, Mart, this bunch can be trusted. Dunark has a lot of darn queer ideas, but he's square as a die. He's our friend and will give, get us the copper. We have no choice now. Anyway, look at the bar. We haven't an ounce of copper left. We're down to the plating in spots. Besides, we can go anywhere if we had a ton of copper because the old bus is a wreck. She won't hold air. You could throw a cat out through the shell in any direction. She'll have to have a lot of work done on her before we can think of leaving. As to staying in her, that wouldn't help us a bit. Still as soft as wood to these folks. Their shells could go through her as though she's made of mush. 
They are made of metal that is harder than diamond and tougher than rubber, and when they strike, they bore in like drill bits. If they are out to get us, they'll do it anyway. Whether we're here or there, so we may as well be guests. But there's no danger, Mark. You know, I swapped brains, brains with him, and I know him as well as I know myself. He's a good square man and one of our kind of folks. Convinced, Crane nodded his head, and the skylight dropped toward the dock. While they were still high in the air, Donnick took an instrument from his belt and rapidly manipulated a small lever. The others felt the air vibrate, a peculiar pulsating wave which, to the surprise of the earthly visitors, they could read without difficulty. It was a message from the Colfadix to the entire city telling of the escape of his party and giving the news that he was accompanied by two great Carfado from another world. Then the pulsations became unintelligible, and all knew that he had turned his instrument away from the general key into an individual key of some one person. I just let my father, the, the Carfidex, know that we are coming, he explained, as the vibrations ceased. From the city beneath them, hundreds of great guns roared forth a welcome. Banners and streamers hung from every possible point, and the air became tinted and perfumed with a bewildering variety of colors and scents, and quivered with a rush of messages of welcome. The Skylark was soon surrounded by a majestic fleet of giant warships who escorted her with impressive ceremony to the landing dock, while around them flitted great numbers of other aircraft. The tiny one-man helicopters darted hither and thither, apparently always in imminent danger of colliding with some of their larger neighbors, but always escaping as though by a miracle. Beautiful pleasure planes soared and dipped and wheeled like giant gulls, and cleaving their stately way through the num numberless lesser craft, immense multiplane passenger liners, partially supported by helicopter screws, turned aside from their scheduled courses to pay homage to the Kofidix of Condal. As the Skylark approached the top of the dock, all the escorting vehicles dropped away and Crane saw that instead of the brilliant assemblage he had expected to see upon the landing place, there was only a small group of persons as completely unadorned as were those in the car. In answer to his look of surprise, the Kofidix said with deep feeling, my father, mother, and the rest of the family, they know that we as escaped captives would be without harness or trappings and are meeting us in the same state. Seton brought the vessel to the dock near the little group, and the earthly visitors remained inside their vessels, while the rulers of Condal welcomed the sons and daughters they had given up for dead. After the affecting reunion, which was very similar to an earthly one under similar circumstances, the Kofidix led his father up to the Skylark and his guests and stepped up upon the dock. Friends, Dunark began, I have told you of my father, Raban, the Karfidix of Condal. Father, it is a great honor to present to you those who rescued us from the Mardanale, Seton, Karfidix of Knowledge, Crane, Karfidix of Wealth, Miss Venman, and Miss Spencer, Karfidix of Duchesne, waving his hand toward him, is the lesser Kofidix of knowledge, captive to the others. The Kofidix Dunark exaggerates our services, deprecated Seton, and doesn't mention the fact that he saved all our lives, but for him we all should have been killed. The Kofidix, disregarding Seton's remark, acknowledged the indebtedness of Condal in heartfelt accents before he led them back to the other party and made the introductions. As all walked toward the elevators, the Emperor turned to his son with a puzzled expression. I know from your message, Denard, that our guests are from a distant solar system, and I can understand your accident with the educator, but I cannot understand the titles of these men. Knowledge and wealth are not ruled over. Are you sure that you have translated their titles correctly? As correctly as I can. We have no words in our language to express the meaning. Their government is a most peculiar one, the rulers all being chosen by the people of the whole nation. Extraordinary, interjected the elder man. How then can anything be accomplished? I do not understand the thing myself. It is utterly unheard of, but they have no royalty as we understand the term. In America, their country, every man is equal. That is, he hastened to correct himself. They are not all equal either, as they have two classes which would rank with royalty, those who have attained to great heights of knowledge and those who have amassed great wealth. This explanation is entirely inadequate and does not give the right idea of their positions, but is as close as I can come to the truth in our language. I am surprised that you should be carrying a prisoner with you, 
Carfido, said Rohan, addressing Seton Crane. You will, of course, be perfect liberty to put him to death in any way that pleases you, just as though you were in your own kingdoms. But perchance you are saving him so that his death will crown your homecoming? The Kofidig spoke in, in answer while Seton, usually so quick to speak, was groping for words. No, father, he is not to be put to death. This is another peculiar custom of the earthmen. They consider it dishonorable to harm a captive or even an unarmed enemy. For that reason, we must treat the Carfidex Duchesne with every courtesy due his rank. But at the same time, he is to be allowed to do only such things as may be permitted by Seton and Crane. Yet they do not seem to be a weak race, mused the older man. They are a mighty race, far advanced in evolution, replied his son. It is not weakness, but a peculiar moral code. We have many things to learn from them, and but few to give them in return. Their visit will mean much to Condal. During this conversation, they had descended to the ground and reached the palace, after traversing grounds even more sumptuous and splendid than those surrounding the palace of Nalboon. Inside the palace walls, the Kofidix himself led the guests to their rooms, accompanied by the major domo and an escort of guards. He explained to them that the rooms were all intercommunicating, each having completely equipped bathrooms. Complete except for cold water, you mean, said Seaton with a smile. There is cold water, rejoined the other, leading them into a bathroom and releasing a ten inch steam of lukewarm water into a small swimming pool built of polished metal, which forms part of every condolian bathroom. But I am forgetting that you like extreme cold. We will install refrigerating machines at once. Don't do it, thank you thanks just the same. We won't be here long enough to make it worthwhile. Dunark smiled and replied that he would make his guests as comf comfortable as he could, and after informing, informing them that in one calm he would return and escort them to the Coprot, took his leave. Scarcely had the guests refreshed themselves when he was back, but he was no longer the Dunark they had known. He now wore a metal leather harness which was one blaze of precious gems, and a leather belt hung with jeweled weapons replaced the familiar hollow girdle of metal. His right hand, arm between the wrist and elbow was almost covered by six bracelets of a transparent metal, deep cobalt blue in color, each set with an incredibly brilliant stone of the same shade. On his left wrist he wore an Asnamian chronometer. This was an instrument resembling the odometer of an automobile, whose numerous revolu revolving segments revealed a large and constantly increasing number, the date and time of the Asnamian day expressed in a decibel number of the Carcomo of Condolian history. Greetings, O guests from Earth. I feel more like myself now that I am again in my trappings than have my weapons at my side. Will you accompany me to Caprat, or are you hung or are you not hungry? As he attached the peculiar timepieces to the wrists of, of the guests with bracelets of the deep blue metal. We accept with thanks, replied Dorothy promptly. We're starving to death as usual. As I walked toward the dining hall, Dunark noticed that Dorothy's eyes strayed toward the bracelets, and he answered her unasked questions. These are our wedding rings. Man and wife exchange bracelets as part of the ceremony. Then you can tell whether a man is married or not, and how many wives he has, simply by looking at his arm. We should have something like that on earth, Dick. Then married men wouldn't find it so easy to pose as bachelors. Robin met them at the door of the great dining hall. He also was in full... Penelope, and Dorothy counted ten of the heavy bracelets upon his right arm as he led them to the places near his own. The place was a replica of the other Asnamian dining hall they had seen, and the women were decorated with the same barbaric splendor of scintillating gems. After the meal, which was a happy one, taking the nature of a celebration in the honor of the return of the captives, Duchesne was directly went directly to his room while the others spent the time until the zero hour in strolling about the splendid grounds, always escorted by many guards. Returning to the room occupied by the two girls, the couple separated, each girl accompanying her lover to the door of his room. Margaret was ill at ease, though trying hard to appear completely self-possessed. "'What is the matter, sweetheart, Peggy?' asked Crane, deliciously. "'I didn't know that you—' she broke off and continued with rush. "'What did Kofidex mean just now when he called you the—' Carfidix of wealth. Well, you see, I happen to have some money, he began. Then are you the great M. Reynolds Crane? She, inter she interrupted in consternation. Leave off the great, she said. Leave off the great, he said. Then noting her expression, he took her in his arms and laughed slightly. Is that all that was bothering you? What does a little money 
amount to between you and me? Nothing. But I'm awfully glad I didn't know it before, she replied as she returned his caress with fervor. That is, it means nothing if you're perfectly sure I'm not. Crane um, broke a lifelong rule and interrupted her. Do not say that, dear. You know as well as I do that between you and me there never have been, are not now, never will be any doubts or any questions. If I could have a real cold bath now, I'd feel fine, remarked Seaton, standing in his own door with Dorothy by his side. I'm no bloomin' Englishman, but in weather as hard as this, I sure would like to dive into a cold, good cold tank. How do you feel after this excitement, Dotty? Up to standard? I'm scared purple, she replied, nestling against him, or at least, if not exactly scared, I'm apprehensive and nervous. I always thought I had good nerves, but everything here is so horrible and unreal that I can't help but feel it. When I'm with you, I really enjoy the experience, but when I'm alone or with Peggy, especially in the sleeping period, which is so awfully long, and when it seems that something terrible is going to happen every minute, my mind goes off in spite of me into thoughts of what may happen. Why, last night, Peggy and I just huddled up to each other in a ghostly yellow funk, dreading we knew not what. The two of us slept hardly at all. I'm sorry, little girl, replied Satan, embracing her tender tenderly. Sorry, sorrier than I can say. I know that your nerves are all right, but you haven't roughed it enough or lived in strange environments enough to be able to feel at home. The reason you feel safer with me is that I feel perfectly at home here myself. Not that your ner nerves are going to pieces or anything like that. It won't be for long, though, sweetheart. As soon as we get the chariot fixed up, we'll beat it back to the earth so fast it'll make your head spin. Yes, I think that's a reason, lover. I hope you won't think I'm a clinging vine, but I can't help being afraid of something here every time I'm away from you. You're so self-reliant, so perfectly at ease here, that it f makes me feel the same way. I am perfectly at ease. There's nothing to be afraid of. I've been in hundreds of worse places right on earth. I sure wish I could be with you all the time. Only you can understand just how much I wish it, but as I said before, it won't be long until we can be together all the time. Dorothy pushed him into his room, followed him within it, closed the door, and put both hands on his arm. Dick, sweetheart, she whispered, while a hot blush suffused her face. You're not as dumb as I thought you were. You're dumber. But if you simply won't say it, I will. Don't you know that a marriage that is legal where it is performed is legal anywhere, and no law says that marriage must be performed upon the earth? He pressed her to his heart in a mighty embrace, and his low voice showed in every vibration the depth of his feeling as he held for the beautiful woman in his arms as he replied i never thought of that sweetheart and i wouldn't have dared mention it if you if i had you're so far away from your family and friends it would seem it wouldn't seem anything of the kind she spoke in broken earnestly don't you see you big dense wonderful man it's the only thing to do we need each other or at least i need you so much now say each other it's right declared her lover with fervor it's foolish to wait. Mother would like to have seen me married, of course, but there will be great advantages even on that side. A grand wedding of the kind we would simply have to have in Washington doesn't appeal to me any more than it does to you and would bore you to extinction. Dad would hate it, too. It's better all around to be married here. Seton, who had been trying to speak, silenced her. I'm convinced, Dottie, have been ever since the first word. If you can see it the way I'm so glad that I can't express it, I've been scared stiff every time I thought of our wedding. I'll speak to the Carfedex the next, first thing in the morning, and we'll be married tomorrow, or rather today, since it's past the zero count. As they gl glanced at the chronometer upon his rich wrist, which, driven by wireless impulses from the master clock in the National Observatory, was clicking off the Darkamo with an almost inaudible purr of his smoothly revolving segments. How would it be to wake up him up and have it done now? Oh, Dick, be reasonable. That would never do. Tomorrow will be most awfully sudden as it is. And, Dick, please speak tomorrow, will you? Peggy's even more scared than I am, and Martin, the dear old stupid, is even less likely to suggest such a thing as this kind of a wedding than you are. Peggy's afraid to suggest it to him. Woman, he said in Mark's sternness, is this a put-up job? It certainly is. Did you think I had nerve enough to do it without help? Seaton turned and opened the door. Mark, bring Peggy over here, he called as he led Dorothy back into the girls' room. Heavens, Dick, be careful. You'll spoil the whole thing. No, I won't. Leave it to me. 
I bashfully admit that I'm a regular bear cat, this diplomatic stuff. Watch my smoke. Folks, he said, when the four were together, Dottie and I have been talking things over, and we've decided that today is the best possible date for a wedding. Dottie's afraid of those long daylight nights, and I admit that I'd sleep a lot so sounder if I knew where she was all the time instead of only part of it. She says she's willing, provided you folks see to it the same way and make it a double. How about it? Margaret blushed furiously, and Crane's lean, handsome face assumed a darker color as he replied. A marriage here would, of course, be legal anywhere, provided we have a certificate. And we could be married again upon our return if we think it desirable. It might look as though we were taking an unfair advantage of the girl's dick. But considering all the circumstances, I think it would be the best thing for everyone concerned. He saw the supreme joy in Margaret's eyes and his own assumed a new light as he drew her into the hollow of his arm. Peggy has known me only a short time, but nothing else in the world is as certain as our love. It is the bride's privilege to set the date, so I will say that it cannot be too soon for me. The sooner the better, said Margaret, with a blush that would have been divine in any earthly light. Did you say today, Dick? I'll see the Carfedex as soon as he gets up, he answered, and he walked with Dorothy to his door. I'm just too supremely happy for words, Dorothy whispered in Seaton's ears as he bade her good night. I won't be able to sleep or anything. And this is the end of chapter 15.